Hello, everybody. Welcome to Health Hackers episode 21. I'm Gemma Evans. I'm a journalist and presenter here in the UK, and this is my series devoted to getting inside the minds of some of the most pioneering figures in health, wellness, and mindset. My guest today is Dr. Ramani Diversala. She's a clinical psychologist and wrote the book titled, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Narcissistic Relationship. Over the next 30 minutes, we will be discussing how to spot and handle the narcissists in your life. But not just that, we're going to touch on sociopaths and psychopaths too. Dr. Ramani, hello and thank you for coming on to Hellmakers. Good morning, Gemma. So here's what I would love to know first. What motivated you to write a book about narcissistic relationships? You know, it's funny, I had no idea where the world was headed when I originally got into this work, and it's funny how it all collided. But when I first started doing this work, what I was really noticing was the clients who were coming into my practice were almost kind of all saying the same thing, like the amount they were suffering at the hands of a partner who was really neglectful and lacked all empathy and was really entitled and there would be really bad behavior on social media. I mean, obviously the, the specifics of the story would vary, but there would be this consistent piece and the way the people who were being affected by these kinds of relationships was consistent. And that pushed me into this literature on narcissism and I was really shocked at how little of the science talked about how other people are affected by it. Like in psychology, we tend to talk about a person, like a person with depression, a person with substance use, what they're going through. But we don't tend to think as much about how others around that person are affected, and especially these personality patterns. And at the same time, in my lab, I'm a university professor at a place called California State University, Los Angeles. We were also studying difficult personality patterns and how that related to health. And what we were finding is that in a healthcare setting, people with these kinds of personality patterns were just wreaking havoc, making life miserable for the, the doctors, for the nurses, for the front desk staff. And so then I realized like, wow, there's just a lot of difficult people out there. And yet everybody keeps giving them second chances. She's having a bad day. It's a tough week at work. She had a mean mother. Like they just kept making excuses for these people. And it seemed like these people just, the, the narcissists were just receiving these excuses and never changing their behavior. The final piece was no matter, and then I had clients who were coming in who were narcissistic. And I thought, nothing I'm doing is working, nothing. I read everything I could, I tried every therapeutic technique, and the best I might do is kind of get them to show up on time or not be as insulting. And I thought, whoa, if I'm going through this, what are their partners? So it was like a lot of things happening at the same time. And then the world, the world took some massive shifts in the last three to five years, and narcissism has sort of now become the new normal. And it's now in the United States, this was a bad week, it's getting dangerous. It's getting dangerous. Wow, narcissism could be the new normal. Oh, it that's, is. The new that's normal. a big statement. Oh my, what, so tell us how, how do you tell the difference between a narcissist and someone who's just a bit arrogant or a little bit that's different? What are the traits that's, of a narcissist? Yeah. It's a great question. And one of the biggest confusions that comes up and actually causes a lot of tension in online forums is like, you should never diagnose someone you've never met. I'm not diagnosing anyone. There is a pattern called narcissistic personality disorder. That is a diagnosis that appears in, in diagnostic manuals like the, the DSM or something called the ICD-10. It's there with all the bells and whistles of a diagnosis, a list of symptoms. Here's the thing. When we diagnose this pattern, not only do you have to have many of these narcissistic patterns, but that person also has to be experiencing significant impairment in their life or distress about the symptoms. Like for example, a person who's depressed it's like, I'm miserable. I'm sad. I can't get out of bed. I can't go to work. They have a subjective sense of discomfort, so they all, they'll go get help in most cases. A person with narcissistic personality disorder, or I should say a person who's narcissistic, often feels like my life's going just fine. I'm making lots of money. I do whatever I want, whenever I want. I don't, I'm not bothered by other people. I just do what I want. So we rarely see narcissistic personality disorder, but this pattern called narcissism. It's just that. It's a pattern. It's like a trait, you know, in some ways. It's almost like saying someone's stubborn or they're sweet or kind. Like we know what that means. And so when we look at this word narcissism and the, the sort of the noun being a narcissist is that it's like a bucket. And in that bucket are all these little words like 
a person who's narcissistic lacks empathy. They're deeply entitled. They think they're special and entitled to special treatment and shouldn't have to go through the hoop jumping that other people would have to go to. They're very grandiose. Um, they're very superficial and shallow. They care tremendously only about appearances and Instagrammable lifestyles and that kind of thing. They're, um, they're constantly seeking validation and admiration. They need other people to say, you're so wonderful, you're so great, like your picture. And that's why, for example, they'll do things like cheat on a partner because it's just one more way to get validation and have someone tell them how attractive they are or something. They're very arrogant. Um, they can tend to be very manipulative and exploitative of other people in relationships. They tend to be deceitful and they tend to lie. Um, they're prone to shame. Like when they do something bad, when they apologize, it's not because they feel bad about the impact it had on someone else that they feel ashamed that they got caught doing something that makes them look bad. You see the difference? So, so yes, yeah, they're, they're, they're afraid, afraid of the judgment. Yeah, they're afraid of the judgment. They don't care that they hurt someone. Yeah, no, they're afraid of the judgment. So they're jerks. I mean, but I don't know. And, and Dr. Alan Francis said this beautifully. He's like, should we really be diagnosing jerks? I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, so that said, it's not a diagnosis. And I think people like to think it's a diagnosis because then there must be some magic pill or therapy that would make it better. Well, there's not. But would a narcissist ever seek help? I mean, if you, okay, let's, let's take it from here. If you are in a relationship and you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, wow, my partner is, is a narcissist. Is there a way of telling that partner, look, I think you're a narcissist, let's get help. Or will a narcissist always be like, I'm not a narcissist, what are you talking about? More often than not, not only will they not say, say I'm not a narcissist, they'll get angry, they'll get defensive, they'll turn around and say, you know what, actually, you're a narcissistic. And they'll twist your reality, they'll accuse you, you're, and they'll, they'll, they'll start blaming their partner for every misery they've ever had. What happens is that once a person in a narcissistic relationship says, you know what, I can't do this anymore, then sometimes the partner will say, okay, I'll get help. But that can feel more like a manipulation, like they're signing up to get help so that that person will not leave the relationship rather than a frank admission that there's something that's not okay about their behavior. Now, all of that said, in a very, very, very tiny number of cases, tiny, I will have people come up and say, I'm a jerk. And I know I'm a jerk. I have cheated on my wife repeatedly. I've treated my colleagues badly. I am all about myself. My life feels empty. Can you help me? I'll work with them. But I got to tell you, basically what ends up happening is that they just now pull the veil back and realize like they're kind of a shallow person. Making them more substantiated and full, that's tough long-term work. It's hard, it's hard to do. And you got to remember, the world, especially if the person's financially successful, the world has told, because most, many, not most, many narcissists are very successful because they tend to be very good business people. They're quick, they're sharp, and they don't care who they hurt. So they're willing to close the deal no matter who they hurt in the process because it's worth it. It's interesting you say that because I remember reading one of your blogs Mm -hmm. in which you wrote calling Donald Trump a narcissist isn't even interesting anymore. It's like it's calling the sun hot and he's hugely successful. He's, he's gotten everything he's ever wanted because he's never, he's, he's revised the story. He doesn't care who he hurts. And like I said, this has been one of the most tragic weeks in America in a long time. Innocence, innocence are getting affected and people are expressing their rage. And, and honestly, it, a, a, sadly, a significant chunk of Americans think there's no problem with that. That's narcissism. That the idea that I can hurt someone because I don't agree with them. Instead of saying, we have different points of view, I may not agree, but I can understand where they're coming from. That's empathy. They don't have it. So why would they, they would just hurt other people. They don't have empathy. So do they ever feel guilty? Mm. Or is it again, it's about how they look? They feel guilty if they are caught and it makes them look bad. They're not like psychopaths. Like psychopaths actually just simply have no remorse. They just sort of take what they want and they have, it's, it's, they're wired differently. Narcissists are a little bit too. I do think that when narcissists, and I, I see this, when narcissists do bad things, they're aware that the thing they're doing is a bad thing. But if that thing is going to be good for them, whether it's a one night stand or a business deal or cheating on a test at school or whatever, the short term gain is meaningful to them and, and it keeps pumping up their ego. 
that even though they're like, well, this isn't a really good thing to do, but I'm going to do it and I'll deal with the problem later. And maybe if I'm lucky, I won't get caught. They're aware what they're doing is wrong. They are. Mm-hmm. They're, they're aware. They see there's a difference between being aware, knowing what, what you're doing is wrong and having empathy for the people who will be affected. Those are two separate processes. Okay. Hey, so you mentioned psychopaths there. We're going to come on to psychopaths and sociopaths, but I just want to take it back to relationships and mm-hmm. Get your thoughts on what somebody should do if if they're realizing now they have a narcissistic partner. Like, mm-hmm. what are the options? How do you deal with this person now? Well, is you, it, my book was called "Should I Stay or Should I Go," and it was called that for a reason because I do think it was important from my position to be respectful of the fact that some people, for a wide range of reasons, both practical and emotional don't feel like they can leave a relationship. It could be finances, it could be children, it could be culture, it could be other medical circumstances, health reasons. It could be that they genuinely feel like they love this person. It's not my place to doubt that. It's my place to help them see things clearly and then give them the tools for whatever decision they make. Now, if you're asking me, if a friend said to me, a dear friend, not a client, but a friend said to me, I'm in a relationship with a narcissist, what should I do? And I said, by all means, please leave you really deserve to take your life back because this will always be half a life with this person. It's like being in a relationship with a narcissist is like looking into a mirror that doesn't reflect you back. It's dis- unsettling and it's disarming because they, they, it doesn't see you. They is, don't there, see is there a way that a narcissist will make you feel about yourself? A specific um, less way? than, less than. Yeah. You're, you're not good enough. You know, remember, at the core of it, the narcissist is insecure, deeply insecure. That's why they're so grandiose. That's why they're so superficial. And that's why they chronically seek validation. Most normal people don't. We like validation. It's always nice to have someone say you look nice. But most of us can get through an entire day feeling pretty damn good, even if we didn't get a single compliment. We can. You know, we like them, but we don't need them. The narcissist needs them. Okay, there's a difference. So in terms of the relationships, if you can go, great. But here's the thing, leaving a narcissist is never easy. They don't like being left. They don't. It's a a blow to their ego. They don't mind leaving people, but they don't like being left. And if it's a marriage and if there's kids and there's money involved, you can expect a brutally painful divorce battle that will drag on for years, that will harm the kids, that will be extraordinarily expensive, that will be very public, that will exhaust you in a way that you don't even know you could be exhausted. If you stay, you have to ratchet your expectations down. Like I say to people, here's the thing, this person isn't changing. What you see today is what you get. You are now going to have to adjust your expectations to this never changing because narcissistic relationships are really kept in place by both hope and fear, right? Hope it's going to get better, fear of what's going to happen to me if I left. So now you know one thing. It's almost like it's, if you woke up every morning and said, today, today the sun is going to rise in the West, you'd be really frustrated every morning. And that's what a relationship with a narcissist is. It's like waiting for that sun to rise in the West every single day. To turn your head and say, look at that. That's the east. That's where the sun's going to rise. And you adjust your expectations and you realize this person doesn't care about you. They're going to keep lying to you. They don't care about your life. They don't care about your sadness. They don't care about your triumph. So here's a word of advice. Don't tell them about it. Make your relationship deeply superficial. In fact, I instruct my clients to make a list of completely superficial topics, ranging from, oh, did you see they're opening a new grocery store? Though, can you imagine? It's going to be very warm this week. Or did you know that the post office now stays open a half hour later? That's all you ever get to talk about. You cannot ever talk about anything substantial again, or they'll break your heart. You never go to them with an important decision. You, always, you almost have to view yourself as being in that relationship alone. Don't think that they're going to want to go support you, do anything with you, listen to you. I say cultivate other networks of friends, um, family. They've likely tried to isolate you. Find ways, whether ideally live, but even if you have to online, because a lot of people think, well, no, I'm in a relationship. They should be there for me. They're not going to be. If you stay, you really are staying in an impoverished condition. And that's how it is. Have you ever had a couple turn up? to you for therapy and you can see immediately one of them's a narcissist and you're thinking well couples therapy isn't going to work because he or she's a narcissist how do you deal with that you know what ends up happening is they tend to burn themselves out in a couple of weeks like it's very clear you know and it's it's the it's usually the narcissist that pulls the plug because what narcissists don't like is to be near people who can see through them 
And once they know that someone's got their number, they will encourage or say, we don't, this person's a hack. They don't know what they're talking about. Or like they'll distance themselves, whether it's a therapist, a family member, a friend, anybody who the narcissist can sense when they're being sussed out. And they will distance themselves and they'll tend to defame that person, say they're ridiculous, they're stupid. And the partner, being in a relationship with a narcissist is a bit like being in a cult. You're, it's like you're brainwashed. And that's why a lot of people very, very unfairly blame people. They say, if he was so bad, then why didn't you get out? And I try to explain to people, once somebody has been doing such a psychological manipulative number on you, it's really, you no longer trust your reality. And since the, the, the narcissist's voice is the loudest in your world, it's easy to go with what they're saying. It's like being in a cult. You almost like blindly follow. And then one day, maybe through therapy, maybe through a friend, when somebody starts waking you up a little bit, then you start waking up. And then one day you realize like, I'm living a lie. Now, some people live the lie till the day they die. I'm not kidding you, Gemma. I've had clients say, Los Angeles is a unique city. The real estate here, just like in places like London, is incredibly expensive. So buying a house or renting a place is very expensive. Particularly people who've been in relationships for a long time. If you own a home and you're married in Los Angeles, the home has to be split in half right? So if somebody's well off, they can buy that partner out. So let's say the house has 500,000 in equity. One person has to come up with $250,000. Well, many times people don't have that. So they're staying in these relationships because they can't afford to buy the other out and neither can afford to leave. And I've literally had people say to me, we're both sitting here waiting for the other one to die. And we're hoping that we're, he, the other person dies first so we can at least have the house. I mean, that's how empty these spaces are and it's a um and this is where the only real way to manage this i tell people is don't get in in the first place you know if you even see or sense one red flag one red flag you're better off spending the rest of your life alone than entering this about some of these red flags i mean would it be subtle ways okay. where the kind of the veil drops and you see him mm -hmm. speaking to or her speaking to a waitress or waiter and you think whoa that was a bit sharp. Are these mm -hmm. the kind of telltale signs yeah. that you should be looking out for? Yep. What will people, people will sometimes say, oh yeah, he was rude to the waiter, but we did have to wait an hour or, or alternatively, he may be very inappropriate with the waitress or a bartender and say, ah, he's probably just nervous. We're early in a relationship. Or it will be um, how they listen to you. you. You listen to their life story for a long time. Then it comes time for you to talk about yourself and you see them looking around the room and really distracted. Well, he did tell me he's a little ADD. Really? He wasn't ADD when he was giving you the two hour version of his damn life. So don't give me ADD. Okay. So you come up when you find yourself explaining this new relationship to friends, but you're making lots of excuses for what feels like really invalidating behavior. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to that because, you know, a lot of people are so desperate to be in a relationship. I've had people say, I ended up marrying the narcissist because I knew he was a bad guy, but all I ever wanted was to be married and he came around at the right time. You have no idea though. This is not, this is, this isn't child's play. This is a mistake, particularly if you have kids that will come back and bite you for the rest of your life. Like, I know I sound like all doom and gloom, but I am seeing people who, even if you don't have kids, the psychological scars these relationships leave are pretty profound. Wow. I have a couple of questions from viewers on Facebook uh, who posted these remarks when I said I was interviewing you today. Um, Dave has a question about handling narcissists. He says, how much is acceptable for an individual to endure? I think this is a really important point. And perhaps you can reiterate on the kind of personal safety factor here. Because if you do decide to stay, where do you draw the line with, mm -hmm. oh, that's because he's a narcissist or, right. whoa, that's not right. I need to get out. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that <laughs> today's question, because it's a really great one, part of it is, each individual has a different endurance, right? You know what I'm saying? Like some people really can have a different pain threshold than others. You raise an important point, Gemma. Part of this does come down to personal safety. If indeed your safety is being impacted, you know, literally like this person is behaving in ways that are dangerous to yourself, 
to the self to the lives of other people around you or your property there's no there's no you just throw yourself in a trash bag and you get out of there kind of thing but it's it's this sense of how what pay attention to yourself because many people i've seen who have what i call almost narcissist survivor syndrome they eat, they look like they have a combination of post traumatic stress and depression they start their mood really starts they have sad mood they, they have um they lose pleasure from activities that usually made them happy they find themselves to be hyper vigilant they're full of self doubt and second guessing if you feel like you're really sliding into that pattern and you're not able to get out of it and you're working on this heavily in therapy it's a bit like taking a person and keep throwing them back into the toxic soup right you have to go back to live with that person you have to ask yourself how much of a toll is this taking on your mental health because i've heard a thousand times people say i'm staying for the kids i'm staying for the kids I'm like at some point your kids witnessing this is actually worse for them than you splitting it's like your kids are screwed either way to be honest with you so to dave's point you know your limits but dave here's the bottom line if you know this person is not going to change if you shelve that idea of hope how long are you going to be able to endure this it's as though you're in a freezing cold place and it's never going to get warm how long can you be in that place and talking of children, can, can children be narcissists? Are you, are you born a narcissist? Mm -mm, no. The, the, basically, this, a lot of this work even comes from some of the work we see that has been done on borderline personality, that there's likely a little bit of a temperamental thing that a person comes into life with. And it could be sort of a biological vulnerability or sort of a hypersensitive temperament or something. However, not everyone with these vulnerabilities and temperaments become narcissistic. Narcissism is largely made it's not born. We wouldn't call a child a narcissist. You know, children by definition are insanely selfish. They're grandiose because they're still working through their fantasy world because that's part of developing as a child. I do tell people though, the single most, the single most important thing I think we can teach a child is empathy. And in order to have good empathy, they have to have a solid sense of themselves. Then they also have to be aware of the needs of other people. So to be self-aware and aware of other people. And that may mean waiting their turn. That may mean checking in with another child. That may mean telling adults that there's a child suffering. Like it's being aware of other people. And when the parents don't have any empathy, it's really hard for them to teach it to them. Kids are by definition entitled. Our job as parents and educators and all of that is to, to take a child aside and say, listen, there's, there's this many toys and we all have to share them and there's a reason for that and you'll enjoy your turn when you get it and nobody gets special treatment here but so many parents are raising their kids saying well no you're more special and i'm going to fight the coach so you get more playing time or more time on the stage or whatever grandiose fantasy the parent has for the child narcissism is largely made it is a disease of in, it's a, i should say a condition of insecurity and that insecurity is often brought by parents who do not uh, who do not nurture their child's inner world. So teaching empathy is teaching a way that we can empathy. help avoid bringing up narcissistic children. Yeah. Yep. Good to know. Um, here's a question. If you think your boss at work is a classic narcissist, but you really want to get on his or her good side, uh, any tips for how we can make narcissists like us or do they just like themselves and that's it? You know, this person asks a great question because, I mean, in the long term, it's going to be a tough strategy because that narcissistic boss will throw you under the bus one day. As a short term strategy, you may try to win a boss over maybe to get a plum assignment or get a good letter so you can leave. You know, it's, again, it's never a long term strategy, but it's so easy. All narcissists crave great validation you may have to i mean you really do it's, it's like you have to pump them up and fluff them and say you know i feel so lucky to be mentored by you your career has been absolutely amazing it's an utter inspiration to me i mean i know how busy you are but would you ever have some time to really sort of i want i want to be you like teach me how you are i mean and then try to then go throw up in the bathroom after you're done <laughs> But I do think that what ends up happening is over time, as you could imagine, this starts feeling inauthentic and hollow. They're so easy to play. I mean, it's in some ways a narcissist. You have to view yourself as a cat with a mouse. We often feel like we're being manipulated by them. They're so easy to play. There's, you just have to, you almost have to say, I'm going in and then just sort of 
fluff them off and validate them, even though you know everything you're saying is ridiculous, you can even get what you need and get out of that situation. It just doesn't feel good. If you're an authentic person, it doesn't feel good to do that. So to that person with the narcissistic boss, validate them. Sometimes, sadly, it means you might have to give up some credit for something you did to them say, you know, I never, I never would have even thought of that sales strategy without you, even though you're the one who came up with the strategy. So you have to hand over a little credit. I see this in academic settings all the time, really big puffed up professors and administrators and investigators. They take all the credit for what these really hardworking junior colleagues are doing in their labs. And so I see that stuff all the time, but it really depends. But there is a point though, to that person with the narcissistic boss, you got to remember this they may not actually advance you because they might want to keep you close by because you're doing such a good job, job validating them. So don't always think that the, that narcissistic boss is only going to do what's good for him or her. They are not mentors. They do not care about other people advancing. They only care that they hold on to power as long as possible. You may be their right-hand man but I can prom or woman, but I can promise you this. The first time they get in trouble, you're going to end up being the fall guy. I guess it goes back to what you said earlier in relationships about you're just going to have to lower your expectations. Yeah, yeah. you have so to lower your expectations. About, let's look about sociopaths now. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are the signs of a sociopath? Mm -hmm. Sociopath, but there's a difference between a sociopath and a psychopath, first of all. Okay. So a lot of people, for some reason, love the word sociopath. I think it makes them feel like they're being smart or something. I guess <laughs> sociopath and psychopath are actually very, very similar. The difference is, is the sociopath is almost a little bit sloppier. You know, they tend not to be as uh, charming. They tend not to be as smart. They tend not to be as slick or as glib. However, similar to the psychopath, they're resentful they're cold, they lack empathy, they lack remorse, um, and they can be downright dangerous. Because they're not as socially slick, they often don't get themselves into the same level of positions of power and relationships. Because in fact, what ends up happening, sometimes a sociopath feels a little pathetic and only down the line a little bit do you realize how dangerous they are. The psychopath, on the other hand, is just smooth, slick, like you're kind of your dangerous CEO or that kind of thing. Like they get all the way to the top and everyone is shocked. You know, like how did they get so far? And if you watch them, they, there was something almost chilling to them. Like you had no doubt, like this person would probably shoot me in a, in a dark alley if it was gonna help them, but they would hide the body so well. Sociopath isn't as good at hiding the body, to be honest with you, but neither would feel bad about doing it. So they're, they're sort of variations on the theme. And the other thing I, I tell my students all the time, all psychopaths and all sociopaths are narcissistic. But not all narcissistic people are psychopathic or sociopathic. It goes back to the idea that the narcissist knows when something is, they shouldn't be doing something. And when they get caught, they feel remorse. They feel more the remorse for themselves. But even the psychopaths like, you know, I gave it a shot and I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to get myself out of this. And they often do. Psychopaths can be incredibly wealthy. They're scary. Like they're people who would be like, I don't know, like run crime syndicates or something like that. And people are terrified of them. So they're often able to get a lot done. And that's a psychopath. That's a psychopath. Can you give us an example of a, and this is really hard, a stereotypical sociopath? Because we think of psychopaths as criminal. You know what? Look, at what the, look at what the United States has been this week. I mean, in this week, we had somebody go into a synagogue and shoot 11 innocent worshipers. We had some other, you know, sociopath sending all these bombs. If you looked at these two men, they were socially unskilled. They had, they were completely alone. They did not have normal work histories. They were angry. They were resentful. They were sullen and they felt absolutely no remorse for the things that they did. They're great examples of sociopaths. Nobody would give them the time of day. They just like, look like creepy sloppy guys. You know, there's nothing slick about them. And that's what makes them not psychopaths. Because yeah, they didn't feel like psychopaths. They felt like sociopaths. Mm -hmm. Another big distinction is psychopathy appears to have a, 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 a central nervous system element to it that they actually, their brains may be different. They're, they're, they likely are born that way. What we call their autonomic nervous system tends to react differently to things. They'd actually make really great like military operatives because they wouldn't get anxious the way the rest of us would, right? Um, sociopaths are believed to be more made. They may come from abusive early environments. They may be indoctrinated into hate, hateful 
kinds of um, thoughts and everything. They may be angry at the world. Like these are people who may actually have been humiliated or bullied by peers or family members. And that makes them really angry and resentful at the world. So they're often made rather than born in the same way the psychopaths were. Like so you'll see psychopaths who come from perfectly, what seem like good families. In the sociopath's background, you'll tend to find something that's really, really unsettling and troubling. So if you think you have a colleague or a friend who's a bit sociopathic, mm -hmm. how should you handle them? Stay the hell away from them. I mean, I mean it. It's like it's, you're not going to win at this game. And if anything, they may actually try to sabotage you in very real ways. And in a way that although at the end of it, like you have to hire lawyers and all this stuff, it may end up okay. The harm it would have done to your physical and mental health, not to mention in some circles, your professional reputation, people just, you don't even want to take that battle on because I almost feel like psychologically and karmically, you can't win that. You know, that they're there. They just destroy everything in their way because they just don't care and they're so angry at the world and so if you have a sociopathic colleague i mean you want to document everything document 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 because some of that might work with hr but these sociopaths these are the types of people who will go into a workplace and start harming the people there harming their cars leaving threatening notes or in the most tragic circumstances killing the people there you know what i'm saying like these are dangerous people it's not this is no longer your narcissistic boss where you can buy him a box of cigars and tell him he's attractive like that's not this this is really people who are sullen resentful angry manipulative um, out to get you feel the world's out to get them and um, they can be very dangerous unsettling colleagues I'd often say to people if you really feel like this is happening and you're in a position where you can slowly exit that position you may even want to consider that because a lot of people say well that's not fair you know what life's not fair and so you know shame on the HR people and the, and the boss who hired this person you allowed that to happen but not everyone can pick this out but the fact of the matter is I, I and then you need to document but I often say to people that even even if it's, it, it, you're going to face upheaval either way. If you're trying to tangle with a sociopathic colleague, it may almost be easier to step away. Do sociopaths have relationships? Mm -hmm. The sociopaths can have relationships. They tend to be very shallow. They tend to be very exploitative. They, they really are, the sociopaths get, get into the relationship to take advantage of that person for money, for contacts, for drugs, for, um, for sex. You know, it's very superficially driven. They tend to have either no relationship or lots of short-term relationships, like three months here, or six months there. If they do get into a longer-term relationship, it's not unusual for it to be riddled with domestic abuse, that sort of thing. So they can, but they really aren't made for it. And if, like I said, when they do get into relationships, it tends to be exploitative, even if it's simply that they want someone to be their maid. You know, it's someone to clean up and cook and that. And they don't, they just don't have that kind of charm of a narcissist. No, not the same kind of charm. Yeah, no. I mean, they can just, yeah, no, they, they come off as a little bit awkward and, and sometimes they come off as quiet. You know, like people like, yeah, he's a hard enough worker. He's quiet. Nobody quite gets him. And you'll often hear that in the postmortems on these crimes that are done. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like we never, he lived upstairs from us, but we never really noticed him kind of thing. He wasn't very friendly is something you'll often hear. Whereas psychopaths can seem quite friendly because they're always trying to use their charm to get what they want. So a psychopath could be, could also be a very successful person. Oh, they go through life often. farming quite everybody. Often. Yeah. And so, but can you have psychopathic tendencies, but not necessarily be a, a criminal? You could just go yeah. through life, well, charming well, people, getting what you want in a kind of brutal way. I look at a lot of multinational corporations. I look at the heads of many world governments. Um, and I look at the heads of many world agencies. Like really, really important people are often quite psychopathic, incredibly successful. And they never see the inside of a jail cell. You know, they commit their crimes quietly. And should you handle them in the same way that you would handle a narcissist? You've got to really suck up to them. Tell them yeah, but you, yeah, but you want to be careful because with a psychopath, you may end up doing their bidding and you may be the one who ends up seeing the inside of a jail cell. Wow. Um, final question. If someone is in a close relationship with a psychopath or somebody is in a relationship with someone who has psychopathic traits, um, what should they do? Because they don't necessarily need to leave because they might not be treated the same way as a narcissist would treat them. Yeah, they would. Should they have this awareness? And if you're in a relationship with a psychopath or a sociopath, yeah. you'll be treated exactly as badly. Yeah. 
yeah, you'll be treated exactly as badly. Because again, it's that narcissistic core that cuts across all three patterns, right? They, they are very exploitative in their relationships. They, are, they do not have any empathy. They're not interested in deep intimacy of any kind. They're distant, they're cold. In fact, they're probably more distant and cold than the narcissist. Because at least the narcissist may sometimes actually try to be an engaged parent for a little while. Like, especially since small children are so unconditional in their validation, they just look cute and they look up at you. Sometimes narcissists do well with that. They'll just hand it to someone else when it cries. A psychopath or sociopath, even if they did become a parent, really would not be that engaged in the process. So it's a very cold relationship. So it's the same thing as before. If you, if you can get out, and here's the thing, psychopaths and sociopaths can be very vengeful. Leaving can be very dangerous. And you often, you may have to enlist the assistance of authorities, including domestic violence authorities. And it can be a dangerous game. I know I said final question, but I have one more because this is just so fascinating. What would happen if you tell a psychopath that they are a psychopath? Yeah, they'll laugh at you. You don't know what you're talking about. They might even view it as a badge of honor. Yeah, yeah, and I'm getting away with it. You know, like again, the psychopath is that criminal who whose success is viewed like, I got away with a perfect crime. And listen, sometimes in our, you know, we look at some like famous armed robbers or stuff and we almost like view them with grudging admiration. Like, whoa, they got away with this. They, they broke the unbreakable safe. I mean, and, and they didn't feel bad about it. It's like, well, it was, it was, it was robbable. So I robbed it kind of thing. So they can almost get folk hero status. So I think that because they, a psychopath cares absolutely nothing about what other people think of them, that if you said that to them, they'd be like, all right, then you better be scared of me. In fact, they love the idea that everyone's frightened of them because it gives them tremendous power. So yeah, they, they thrive on that. Well, that is so fascinating. Dr. Ramani, I'm so grateful to you. We are sadly up on time. Um, Can you just remind the listeners and viewers where people can find out more about you on social media? Absolutely. You can go to our website at drramani.com, which is D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I.com. You can find us on all social media at Dr. Romani, D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I. And on our social media, we regularly, you know, post things about narcissism, about interesting articles about it. We welcome questions. Um, and then I do have a new book coming out next year and we'll keep people posted on when that releases. And, you know, just information on what not only I'm doing, but a lot of people are doing in this area sort of as a clearinghouse to educate people. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, social media must be making more narcissists of us all. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and you can also catch me on a weekly podcast called Sexual Disorientation. Ah. And so and, and you can also send in questions and whatnot. We can answer those. Great. Well, I'm going to put links to this uh, in you. the show notes, everybody. And um, thank you once again, Dr. Thank Mami. you, Gemma. It was my um, pleasure. And if you're listening or watching this, I would love it if you left a nice review on iTunes or SoundCloud and you can follow me on Twitter at Gemma Evans, Instagram at Health Hacker Gemma, or watch on Facebook at Gemma Evans Broadcaster. Thank you and goodbye for this time.